Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our 23rd Core Dev call. Um, as always, let me share some context here. These Core Dev calls are for core contributors to present what they've been working on and discuss upcoming features and protocol changes with community members like you. Um, while there's time for Q&A, after each topic, you're highly encouraged to continue the conversations over forums, the Discord, uh, GitHub. Everything is out in the open, and we do want your feedback. It's not always easy to fit everything into a one-hour slot and have lengthy discussions, so do make use of those channels. Um, I'm going to paste in the, um, in, the, in the show notes and in this chat um, a link to the Graphs ecosystem calendar so that you can follow up and subscribe to future calls. Um, lastly, I want to mention that core dev teams have been posting monthly general updates in the forum. I highly recommend you all to check it out. I'm going to paste the link as well. And in the following two or three days, we'll have fresh updates uh, for this last month. So do stay tuned. And before I move to the agenda, let me just highlight um, last Tuesday's graph quarterly update public call. We've covered a bunch, it's packed, it's packed with great information and KPIs, and I'll leave a link to the recording and also the Twitter or X, however you want to call it, post with a great summary um, of all of these things we've presented. So yes, I'm going to paste the link soon. And now the agenda, I posted this in the forum, we might have some updates though, Scalar. Um, top. We'll start with this. Stands, top stands for Timeline Aggregation Protocol. It's an add-on to the existing scalar microtransactions system developed by Graph Core developers, which indexers are currently um, using to track and settle payments for queries. The new protocol reduces trust assumptions, primarily between indexers and gateways. Um, last month, Alexi covered the details of the protocol, and um, today we'll do a follow-up covering more um, the implementation and rollout plan. I'm going to paste a link to this GIP54, which we have in our repo, but not in the forum yet. Um, it's going to be there soon. Um, sorry, just take a look at the chat. Okay, related to Scalar, still related to Scalar, we have permissionless payer, GIP56. Zach from Edge and Node has recently covered the details of this GIP in this week's indexer office hours. It did spark an interesting and healthy discussion, I should say, with indexers. They, you, we got some positive feed, uh, feedback, but I believe it's still relevant and worth doing it on this core dev call um, as the target audience is different. And yeah, as mentioned, it is related to the Scalar top uh, GIP. So all these efforts ensure we stick to our values and work towards a decentralized, fully trustless and permissionless network. So it's great to have Zach over again and share this uh, with all of you. So thanks, Zach. Then shifting gears a little bit, we'll hear from GraphOps, uh, who've been working hard on tooling like um, GraphCast, Launchpad V2. I believe we're close to a, a Launchpad V2 soft launch. And related to GraphCast, I, there are interesting new subgraph radio features. I'm sure subgraph developers will appreciate. I'm not wanting to spill the beans too much, but devs suffering from the N minus one problem or downtime during a subgraph upgrade should pay attention to these. It's pretty cool. Um, if you've seen the quarterly update last Tuesday, you probably noticed that that's one of the focus for the next quarter to um, ensure that we um, pay attention to what developers are um, giving us feed, feedback on and date map that may be blocking them from moving their subgraphs from the hosted service to the uh, decentralized network. So it's pretty cool to see that GraphOps is also helping us out, particularly with this N minus one problem. We'll get into the details soon. Um, lastly, graph node, um, there's been some updates and it's been a while. Um, we've had uh, Adam joining us. So there's some exciting stuff happening in graph node land as well. And we want to share these and discuss with you soon. So. That's it, not QA. I have to change this slide. <laughs> Let's get started. First one was um, Tomash, Semiotic Labs. Tomash, are you on the call? Let me check. You may need. Oh, there you go. Your co host now. Co host. You should be able to unmute and cool. share your screen. Yes. There you go. Yes. Hey. Hi. Hi there. Come. Hi, everyone. Mm. 
Good morning, good afternoon. All right. So depending on the needs, I can just go to integration plan or do more, more detailed update on what we are working on for, for the last few weeks when it comes to integration. What do you want? I think uh, it might be worth to do a very quick intro to Scalar Tap or a recap just to level set everyone. Um, if All folks right. need to read more about it, they can watch the previous recording or last month's recording or read the GIP, but just so we have a smooth transition into the integration plan, I think it's worth taking one or two minutes, yeah, to recap cool. what it is, the focus. Cool, thanks. Um, all right, so so when it comes to recap, uh, Alexis gave a really great, really great presentation and presented that, that a week ago, uh, a month ago. So for those of you who haven't seen that, right, we can share that once again, or you can go to that recording. So, uh, so that's that's one. What happened since then? We've been working hard on the integration, and that integration actually spin off, spinned like two other big projects. Uh, one of them is uh, actually we started porting Dexter service to Rust. And this is a joint work with between GraphOps and, and, and Semiotic. The other one is something that we called uh, before collateralization, and then we renamed that recently to escrow. Uh, so it was supposed to be just a tiny smart contract, and it's growing. The scope of that growing, we are building subgraph for for that too to track those, um, um, you know, uh, 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 well escrows that that people are 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 creating. Uh, in short. The idea is here that there is some there is a money locked in the uh, there is GRT locked in the system and the, um, and every time when a query is sent to the indexer the, the the indexer is checking whether there is enough you know enough GRTs locked for the query to be executed, right? Um, so when it comes to the uh, I've got a few minutes. So when it comes to what we are doing recently, so as uh, as Pedro already mentioned, we were uh, working on GIPs. So we are learning you know what's the process in here so this is done it's submitted sorry i need to i need to post that that on forum but it's going to i'll do it today uh alexis is working mostly on on porting of that uh rust indexer service this is very chaotic i've got like a summary you know at the end of most important points when it comes to smart contracts we started out that this is joint work be between uh, semiotic and, and agile note in here we were working with thomas and with with, um, uh, with uh, pablo um it's going good as far as i know we've got open zeppelin is is, uh, is auditing our smart contracts we are waiting for the first feedback um then escrow that's rebranding, as I've mentioned. There are some PRs happening. Uh, the plan is to, to get it done, to, to have that smart contract. Uh, smart contract is done, but now the, the escrow subgraph, and we want to do it by the middle of August and then deploy that to host service first. Mm, then gateway in here, it's mostly Alexis and Theo. Mm, we are building that aggregator service. So tap on its own is finished. We've got the aggregator implemented. We've got the tab core, tab manager, plenty of components implemented. We tested that. We've got some integration tests, but now, of course, you know, putting it all together. So there are two main components when it comes to gateway one. There's be a new service that is just doing the aggregation of the of the receipts. Mm, so this is ongoing, and then the second one is is integration of gateway with, with type library. Mm, once again, bigger project. When it comes to Integration with Indexer, like I said, we, we ended up with much bigger project. Alexis is leading that. So as you can see, Alexis is doing super crazy hard work in, in, in right now, helping with the whole integration. So, uh, but in here he's working, he started working with Hope and, and Petco, maybe he's supporting, I, I don't know. This is an update from, from a week ago when we synced. Uh, so Alexis, so, um, you know, so I'm, I, I don't want to shoot in here like Chris. Chris probably knows more uh, whether he's going to throw more resources in here. So this this whole thing is, is being developed on our side, but also we, we got some support. And uh, this work basically was started by Hope. And we just said, OK, it will be better to 
to do it nicely because there is a whole new piece of logic that needs to be implemented when it comes to handling receipts, uh, handling the, the, the rubs, the, the receipt aggregates and so on. Mm. So in short, this is the, 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 the plan for the integration and deployment. So there are two stages right now. In the middle of August, we plan to have that escrow subgraph and, and, and integrate uh, gateway with, with tap library. By the end of August, we plan to have that aggregator service up and running. In the middle of September, we want to finish the smart contract audit and hopefully, you know, everything will be will be okay and, and there won't be any, uh, you know, uh, crucial flaws found in, the, in, in those smart contracts. By the end of September, you know, we are porting, uh, we want to finish porting of indexer service to Rust and then then we'll start deployment. So, so once again, there are many things happening in parallel. So by end of August, we want to start deploying on, on, uh, the, the smart contracts on staging testnet before the audit is finished, just to you know keep the things going. Um, by end of sep September, we want to try to deploy on production testnet, where we will test the, the whole integrated scalar tab solution. October testing, benchmarking, feedback, and some you know, feedback from the community and some iterations, right? And November, we plan to, we, we plan to deploy everything on mainnet. All right, so that's the, more or less the plan. Some Q&As uh, that, that, that uh, uh, Pedro sent to me um, in advance. For indexers, most, important, most importantly, when will they need to upgrade? Well, we'll know better in, in October, right? There are many moving pieces as, as, as I wanted to highlight, uh, but we think that for now, just you know, keep it safe, don't worry. In October, we'll, we'll know better. Uh, when it comes, what's, this, what's the upgrade window? So nothing, uh, nothing unusual. Well, a standard window for updating the indexer stack. We don't need anything else. Moreover, it's very important to know that both the indexer and gateway will be fully backwards compatible, which means that they will be handling both gateway and indexer stack will be handling all the new receipts at the same time. Uh, as long as uh, even after the update, right, indexer will be able to to collect money for the old receipts, but instantly will start, you know. Uh, um, producing receipts using following scalar or tap instead of, instead of just scalar. Uh, the same goes to gateway. Gateway will be able to handle both. Mm, how can it be tested on tested? Okay, so we this this is a we don't have a super super concrete plan. We know that we leverage some 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 tools that that the system created in particular. Uh, as Pedro was, uh, I discussed that with Pedro. And there's this graph plus uh, QTS. Or traffic generation that was built and tested for on, on MIPS program. We hope to leverage that. And of course, this is the joint work once again in here, you know, I'm being to, to, to Tio, right? Like, hey, Tio, we, Tio has this, this magic skill of running some scripts that, you know, for, for setting up gateway. Um, so we will we'll collaborate on this. And what actions? No action items for you guys at that point. Just you know, stay calm. It's, it's coming. It, it's going to be there soon. Uh, we are on on the right track. Mm. All right. Any additional questions? Anyone? Is there like a forum that I should wait? There is chat. Okay, let me open chat. There is chat. Everyone can use the chat. And if you want to talk, write in the chat or react, and I'll. Make your co-host so that you can speak. Yeah. All right. So I don't see any other questions instead sort of statement. Alexis is a beast. I confirm. He's amazing. That's why he's the he's the, the, the guy, right? Uh, in semiotic. And Petco um, says exciting stuff. Of course, knowing things are being put yeah. to rest, I wouldn't expect anything else from him. Yeah, it's super exciting to have you with us. If you know depending on, on the decisions, right, in, 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 in graph ops. Um, all right. All right. All right. I think we're done. Very cool. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, I'll be monitoring the chat. Folks, feel free to ask questions if you still have them. Yeah, and please, again, feel free. Absolutely. It will be in the, the, it should be on the forum, the Scalar Tap uh, GIP soon. 
Yeah. Yeah, it will be the form today. Sorry, we I work on that yeah. new brand a few days ago, and clearly we miscommunicated. It's not there. I was thinking that he's doing that. Probably he's thinking I'm doing that. So yeah, my fault. We're my bad. Patient. We're patient. Right, waiting. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Hey Zach, I see you're coming online. Oh, you're not. Are you co-host? Yeah, you are. Yes, I am. Should be able. There you go. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. All right, so the uh, the permissionless payment GIP would remove a check in the protocol, and that check limits incoming fees to pre-approved gateways. And there are several reasons why we might want to remove this limitation. Uh, the first reason is censorship resistance. So one of the goals of Edge and Node is to increase the graph's censorship resistance. And one straightforward way to make a system censorship resistant is to make the system permissionless because censorship resistance is a property of permissionless systems. So we want to make the graph as permissionless as possible. And that's you know, exactly what this change does. It just removes a, the permission needed to pay into the graph protocol. <clears throat> Excuse me. So another reason for this GIP is that we're starting to see novel experiences that are enabled by the graph which would be improved by removing the restriction. So an example of one such novel experience is Playground Analytics, and uh, they developed a user experience around data analytics utilizing the graph, and they provide a value-add experience to end users of the graph, but uh, providing, another, uh, providing this experience through another gateway is possible. Um, but it's it's an extra step for them, right? Which would lead to increased cost and degraded quality of service, right? So that unnecessary extra step is not ideal. Uh, instead, they would prefer to interface directly with indexers uh, to provide the best experience at the lowest cost possible. Um, another example is fees for new data services like Firehose, right? We're expecting there to be demand for indexer to indexer firehose applications uh, for um, indexing subgraphs. And uh, indexers would not necessarily need a gateway for that purpose. Um, and any indexer would want to be able to send fees directly to other indexers. Um, and that's just a much more straightforward implementation of that kind of a feature. Uh, and it, it ties into you know, the, the graph as a, as a world of data services and expanding beyond just GraphQL and, and subgraphs. Um, since we talked about scalar tap earlier on this call, it's, it's worth noting that there's a tie in here. Um, if we were to release a governance free scalar tap and um, scalar tap were added to the asset holders list uh, as an allowed payer, um, we would have inadvertently enabled this GIP in a sense because anyone can pay Scalar Tap and, and Scalar Tap can pay the protocol. That would mean that anyone could pay the protocol through Scalar Tap. So we didn't want to do this on accident. Instead, we wanted to make everyone aware uh, and make this a conscious decision by the community, have this GIP accepted um and thereby have the the permission you know removed so that scalar tap can can be implemented in a straightforward way rather than um have governance leak into scalar tap and and add another allow list to make only certain people be able to use scalar um you know but if this gip is rejected for some reason then that's exactly what we're going to have to do um the GIP itself is short and sweet, so I hope you'll take some time to check it out on the forum and leave some comments. Uh, also, we did we did not allocate time for questions on this topic, so if you if you have any questions, please ask them on the forum. That is all. There you go. Thanks, Zach. And I've I placed it in the chat, and I'll do it in show notes as well. A link to the forum. There you go. Okay. Yeah. We are ready. Thanks, Zach, again. Um, Anna from GraphOps. Um, I believe you're first, not Petco. Yeah, Anna on Launchpad. And again, do use the forum, please, to provide any feedback and ask questions because that's the appropriate medium.
All right, Anna, we can see your screen, screen, but you're still muted. Yeah, okay. All right, so greetings, everyone. Um, today marks a very important mil milestone for indexers as we bring to you a long-awaited update on Launchpad. So before we delve into all of the details, I'd like to extend a special note of gratitude to our newest GraphOps colleagues, so Carlos Jorge, who's on the call today, uh, whose relentless efforts have significantly contributed to this project. Additionally, I wanna say a thank you uh, to all of the indexers that have shown patience and provided valuable feedback along the way, as well as the GraphOps team. Okay, so, So why Launchpad? Uh, just a quick rem re reminder. Last October, we introduced the Launchpad project as a one-stop solution for indexing infrastructure from host orchestration all the way to running and operating multiple chains following large-scale infrastructure principles. This is what we now call Launchpad V1. So Launchpad V1 included host and network abstractions, declarative version controlled infrastructure as code, good but easy to override security and performance deep defaults. And all of this was possible by utilizing containerized applications and Kubernetes for orchestrating workloads in multi-host clusters. Since then, we've been actively gathering feedback from different indexers and we have been drawing um, from both their insights and our own operational experience with Launchpad um, as such a new version was born. So enter Launchpad V2. But uh, before we introduce Launchpad V2, let's briefly review some of the issues that were pointed out with V1. So some indexers expressed their need to use Launchpad charts which was previously renamed Helm Chart um, without using the full Launchpad stack. So while this was somewhat achievable previously, the process lacked um, sufficient explicitness and clarity. Some indexers were not inclined towards using K0S as their Kubernetes distribution. Furthermore, um, it became evident that the project's maturity was not up to our initial expectations and its level of support for troubleshooting and issue resolution um, did not consistently meet the standards uh, that you typically expect from such projects. Uh, some indexers also expressed a desire to utilize Launchpad while integrating their own Kubernetes cluster, whether that was self-managed or through a cloud manager. And while this option was available previously, the inclusion of K0S layer in the stack introduced confusion. Additionally, Launchpad Core's submodule workflow was clunky, confusing, and it did not allow for selectively inheriting updates. And finally, indexer uh, expressed the need for a more modular design. So we've listened to the feedback and as such, version two comes with the following changes. So Launchpad charts officially uh, is officially supported outside of the Launchpad stack. That means that you can use um, our charts in any Kubernetes context and without using Launchpad otherwise. There is no more K0S provisioning layer, and there is no more Ansible. That means that you can bring your own distribution of Kubernetes, uh, whether it's self-managed or cloud-managed. Additionally, you are encouraged to check our documentation if you need a guide for provisioning a Kubernetes cluster. We have fully replaced the host orchestration piece with guides as we recognize that indexers will re, uh, rely on different providers and server set, setups. And therefore it was unrealistic for a single 
host orchestration layer to meet everyone's needs. We have thrown away Launchpad Core, some module, and replaced it with Launchpad namespaces. The namespaces configuration includes flavors and features, where flavors refer to different sets of default values for a namespace that are best suited for different scenarios. So for example, deploying against mainnet versus deploying against girly. And features provide means to toggle some releases that make sense as originally being optional. An example of that is ZFS local PV support in the storage namespace. Switching to Launchpad namespaces also means that the user can selectively inherit namespace updates without conflicts. And Launchpad namespaces comes with multiple release channels for tracking updates, so stable and canary to fit different indexers risk appetite. Um, of course, Launchpad Starter has now been updated to inherit from Launchpad namespaces, which means that you can easily get started with Launchpad using um, cloning Launchpad Starter repo. And all of these changes have enabled us to have a much more modular design. Okay, but do you remember what Launchpad really is? So Launchpad is a starter repository paired with client-side tools installed on your local machine designed to work seamlessly together, offering a streamlined and declarative approach to orchestrating the software stack within your Kubernetes cluster. From the user tooling point of view, Launchpad is comprised of the following tools. Task files, which are used for defining and running scripted tasks on your local machine. So if you are familiar with makefile, task file fits a similar purpose and functionality, and task file was used in Launchpad v1 as well. Helm files, which is the declarative configuration files used to manage and deploy Helm charts and release and releases in Kubernetes applications, as well previously used in, Hel uh, in v1. Helm, the package manager for Kubernetes that streamlines deployment and management of applications through templated configurations, otherwise known as charts, and kubectl, the CLI for directly interacting with the Kubernetes cluster. You will notice that this diagram, if you remember it from V1, is a lot more lightweight now. From the application deployed in a cluster point of view, Launchpad consists of the following layers. So as before, we have core cluster services, including monitoring that uh, was comprised and is comprised of Grafana, Prometheus, and Loki. Secrets management that um, is still using sealed secrets, but we have very um, detailed plans to change that to a different solution. Storage um, layer with multiple tools to pick from. Ingress for networking and Postgres operator. We also have pre-configured namespaces for your graph indexer stack and all the dependencies like major blockchains. And finally, the last workflow of Launchpad involves an interconnected set of repositories that collaboratively, collaboratively provide users with a comprehensive view. So as a user, you initiate this process of integrating with Launchpad by navigating to Launchpad Starter repository. You would clone this into your designated Launchpad repository, which is illustrated in this diagram as your infrastructure and can be named whatever you want. And with this action, you will, your, your own repository, your infra repository will encompass task file definitions for various tasks, along with a sample Helm file that references various other Helm files hosted in the Launchpad namespaces. The Launchpad namespaces repo includes stable and canary release channels to cater for different indexers risk appetite, and each namespace continues 
uh, contains pre-configured Helm releases that are easily customizable, as well as offering feature toggles and flavors, as previously mentioned, something like it girly, it mainnet, and so on. Uh, the launchpad namespace is Helm file and configurations will in turn reference charts uh, that um, are defined in the Launchpad Charts repository. So this visual uh, shows how these various repositories have been orchestrated to inherit updates from upstream and to together provide the user with a great level of modularity. Okay, so overall, that's what we've changed. Uh, now, let's quickly remember, remind everyone, uh, what is the Launchpad demographic? So who should consider it? So you want to use Launchpad if you plan to go multi-host at some point. You want to use it if Kubernetes, you, you want to use Kubernetes for orchestrating your workloads. Also, if you are willing to invest in learning Kubernetes, then Launchpad is suited for you. And finally, if you are planning to scale your indexing operations across many chains, Launchpad can help with that. Okay, so some of the next steps. Um, we'll, we'll have a brief look at Launchpad docs in a minute, but um, what everyone should know is that we are reviving Launchpad office hours with the next session being um, next week, 16th of August at 5 p.m. UTC on Wednesday and every week after. Uh, you can find the link to the Launchpad Discord channel where you can engage with us and ask us questions um, of any kind. And we have included all of the resources, all of the different repos. Um, and with that, let's quickly have finished with a quick look at the docs. Um, okay, so I'm just making sure you can see, see my docs. We can, Anna. Thank you. Going into the introduction guide, here you can see a lot of some of the things I've covered today in terms of what are the major components to be aware of, some of the diagrams we've went through, features and next steps. You have a prerequisite page that you should read to make sure that you meet uh, the bare minimum before engaging with this um, um, project. Uh, we have a quick start page that takes you from all the way from installing task file to cloning Launchpad starter and um, starting to use Launchpad, uh, you know, syncing your Helm file YAML um, with your cluster and finally uh, deploying blockchain namespaces as, as desired. And there's other guides, and uh, this is still a bit of a work in progress. Uh, we're still adding a lot of uh, information here. Now, going into Launchpad namespaces, so it's important to note that we have not included Launchpad namespaces documentation into our official docs because we have um, we have made Launchpad namespaces um, have automated documentation that is updated every time we add new releases. Uh, so, so you have an introduction, you have all of the features of Launchpad namespaces, how to get started, um, how to contribute as well, how to update, so for example, how to change a reference from using a different release channel um, and so on. So you have all of this data at the tree of the repository. And then for each namespace, we have added as well um, documentation that is auto-generated that includes details about the specific releases that the namespace uh, provides, as well as features, um, how to update, um, plus um, all of the different values that are included into the 
values that YAML um, of, of the launch pad names of the specific launch pad, um, namespace. So in this case, Arbitrum. So all of the things you can enable with the Arbitrum namespace. Uh, similarly, Launchpad charts, um, while it doesn't have um, a main readme, it, uh, it includes all of the different applications, templated applications that uh, make up the Helm charts. So for example, if you go to Arbitrum, uh, we have also added auto-generated re readmes similar to Launchpad namespaces. Um, they include all the details of what you can do with the charts. We're still adding details here as well. But um, yeah, we are looking forward to all of your feedback. And uh, please do check out all of the, these different resources. OK, this was everything I had to share for today. So please. Let us know if you have any comments or questions. Very cool, Anna. Thank you so much. We have two minutes still for your slot. So you can ask if people want to ask questions, you can do so. Amazing work, by the way. So if I understood correctly, it is launched already. I haven't checked the repo, correct? Um, the All of the repos are publicly available. Uh, we will start... Um, guiding people through um, how they can use it and stuff like that in Launchpad office hours. You can consider it launched, soft launch. Um, we're still adding things as we go, but uh, yeah, everything is public right now. Everything is live, yeah. Yeah, I see it now. Very, very interesting. I love the docs. Matthew says next Firehose support. Of course. It is on the list, Matthew. Um, it just, you know, we just haven't yet gotten to it, but it is on the list. Okay. I'm assuming those calls will also be recorded, the Launchpad office hours and uploaded uh, to YouTube. Yeah, so. They haven't been in the past. It's a more of a ad hoc, but uh, we can record when we do a demo. We can record for sure. So. All right. I don't see any questions, just a lot of hearts and raised hands and smiles. So we're good. Thank you, Anna. Thanks. Um, thank yeah, you. Thanks and whole, I do want to say again, big thank you to Carlos. He has done a lot of this. So um, yeah. Thank you, Carlos. I know you're here. He's lurking in the dark. What is he? All right. Uh, continuing with GraphOps. Petko, do you want to come online? Hello. Can you hear me? My sound Hello. fine? Hi. Yes, sir. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, let me just share my screen. Anna, you might need to stop, or maybe Petko will do it over. I think I can do it over. Yeah. There you go. There. Yep. Okay. So uh, if we had done this, um, on the next core dev call, it would have been exactly one year since our since the last time we spoke about Graphcast at a core dev call, which is obviously a long time and a lot of stuff have has happened since then. And I want to jump on the shout out wave. I want to personally thank Hope. Hope has been instrumental to Graphcast, but also uh, also uh, Chris and the rest of the team have played a huge role in the developments of of Graphcast. So. Yeah, thanks a ton. Now that we've 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 uh, gone gone past that, um, yeah, it's been one year. So what has changed? Um, let's just oops. Uh, yeah, let's just go through the things that we've be, we are going to be covering today. First, we're gonna say we're gonna talk about why uh, why we even need Graphcast, then what Graphcast is, uh, what the Graphcast SDK is, what are radios, what is the subgraph radio. Uh, and what is the POI cross-checking feature of the subgraph radio? Then we're going to talk about something that uh, Pedro um, alluded to a bit, which is the subgraph upgrade pre-syncing feature. It's been called a lot of things, N plus one upgrades, subgraph versioning upgrades, but it's 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 the same thing. Then we'll speak about something called a one-shot CLI, and then talk about next steps for Graphcast. So, without further ado, as you know, at the heart of any network lies. Um, 
um, coordination. Network participants need to send signals to one another, and you can see examples of these signals on the slide. But um, when the blockchain intermediates these signals, uh, sending a signal requires sending a transaction on the blockchain. These transactions cost gas, which makes some types of signaling or coordination between participants too expensive, unfortunately. Sending signals to other network participants can have a high cost. That, that cost is determined by the cost of transacting on the Ethereum blockchain or any other chain, really. Like, it, it's not free. So what, what is GraphCast and, and how does it fit into this uh, issue? Well, GraphCast solves this problem by acting as a optional, decentralized, distributed peer-to-peer -peer communication layer of the graph stack that allows indexers across the network, but not just indexers, but we'll get to that in a bit, to exchange information in real time. The cost of exchanging these peer-to-peer uh, -peer messages is near zero. Of course, you get the trade-off that um, data integrity is not guaranteed that way out of the box, but GraphCast aims to provide message validity guarantees Nevertheless, um, for instance, GraphCast can provide the guarantee that the message is uh, valid and uh, because it was signed by a known participant um, in the protocol. Um, so GraphCast allows network participants to exchange information in, in real time. It's designed to overcome the high cost of signal and, and, and coordination between participants um, by enabling off-chain communication facilitated by gossip. So GraphCast is something like a, a domain-specific gossip network, you can say. And this is particularly useful for um, applications where real-time communication is essential, but the cost of on-chain transaction is prohibitive. So how does this work uh, exactly? Uh, well, it's made possible by two main components, the GraphCast SDK and radios built on top of it. So the GraphCast SDK is the base layer, which interfaces with Components of the graph stack. Uh, this includes interactions with a graph node, uh, optionally with a uh, indexer management server, um, but also interactions with the core network and registry subgraphs. Uh, the GraphCast SDK is written in Rust and distributed as a Rust crate on crates.io. And radios are mm, highly customizable applications built with the help of the GraphCast SDK. Um, which define, so the radios themselves uh, define the specific message formats and, and logic around constructing and handling each message um, that is relevant to the radio. So radios are effectively the nodes communicating in the GraphCast network. Radios are, of course, also written in Rust. They are Rust applications. And one of these radios is the subgraph radio. So the subgraph radio relies on the GraphCast network to facilitate the exchange of subgraph data and information among um, indexers and other network participants. It uh, imports and makes use of generalized um, interfaces, structs, and functions from the SDK, but handles the radio-specific logic, like message formats, um, the way messages are handled, stored, and, and, and all of that by itself. Um, so. Some of you might remember us talking about a POI radio, even uh, on the last CoreDev call that we, we spoke about this. And POI radio has evolved. So while we were developing um, POI radio, we realized that it was surfacing a wide range of subgraph data from all of the um, sources beneath it. So like the graph node, uh, the core network subgraph, and, and, and everything else that was used. And that same data, uh, would be needed for a lot of other radios that we plan to build, a lot, a lot of other use cases for different radios. But so instead of creating new radios uh, for other use cases that rely on the same or similar underlying data, we now have multiple features in one radio. And so the POI cross-checking uh, feature uh, exists in the subgraph radio now. Uh, as we all know, indexers must generate valid POIs to earn indexing rewards, and um, that and that way, um, because of that, they find it beneficial to alert each other uh, on the health status of subgraphs and community discussions, and and uh, investigate if they have uh, like a, a different data, pretty much. And the POI cross-checking feature within subgraph radio alleviates a lot of this manual workflow. So if it detects a divergence in POIs. Subgraph radio acts as a warning system, alerting the indexer within minutes, sometimes within seconds, um, of when that um, 
when that diversion when that divergence occurs. So just some general information and, and on the graph you can, you can see how the this this data is is kind of structured and, and, and how it how it flows uh, within the POR cross-checking feature. So all of the POIs that are generated through the POR cross-checking feature are public, so uh, normalized, meaning that they are hashed with a 0x0 uh, indexer address and, and they can be compared between um, um, indexers. So the subgraph radio groups and, and, and weighs these uh, normalized POIs according to the uh, aggregate stake in GRT attesting to each POI. So the, And then the normalized POI with the biggest aggregate attesting stake is deemed the canonical or consensus POI and is used for a comparison to the locally generated POI. Um, and the uh, POI cross-checking feature is absolutely production ready. We are using it on our own um, indexer on mainnet. And uh, right now there's more than a hundred subgraphs on the network that are currently being actively cross-checked uh, with the help of subgraph radio. So now let's see how indexers can run subgraph radio. Um, we, we have a uh, Docker image uh, packaged and you can uh, find um, that in our GitHub repo. So this is how you would run it with all the required environment variables. Um, you can also embed it in your Docker Compose setup. And there's a PR for uh, adding subgraph radio to Stake Squid's Docker Compose stack. I know that the wonder, wonderful maintainer of that repo is uh, here with us. So I will kindly uh, ask him to merge it whenever he has the chance. So um, the subgraph radio exposes Prometheus metrics and we provide a Grafana dashboard JSON and the subgraph radio repo on GitHub that users can use to import um, this, this, this dashboard, this view directly uh, into their Grafana setup. It, 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 by the way, that, that comes out of the box uh, in Stake Squid's Docker Compose stack or would. Um, so as you can see, there's a, a, a wide range of metrics here, including the currently matching and diverging subgraphs, um, averages for received messages, data for local attestations, and much more. Um, one of the, like the most important things is the um, aggregation view, because it gives you an overview of uh, all of the different uh, public POIs for each subgraph and how many indexers are attesting to each one, as well as how much aggregate GRT stake is attesting to each one of those POIs. Um, subgraph radio also supports notifications. So if the bot tokens are um, set up, it will, it will send uh, notifications when, uh, when a divergence um, occurs. Um, and yeah, here is uh, some some very some very new and exciting stuff. Uh, the upgrade pre-syncing feature uh, has been discussed for a long time now. It's also been referred to as the subgraph version feature, the N plus one subgraph update feature. And uh, initially, uh, we also considered to have it as a separate radio, but um, ultimately we settled on it being a feature on subgraph radio, following the same reasoning uh, that applies to the uh, POI cross-checking feature. Um, the upgrade pre-syncing feature provides a way for subgraph developers to signal when they plan on releasing a new subgraph version, thereby allowing indexers to start syncing the subgraph in advance. So if the radio operator, if the subgraph radio um, operator has set up the notification system, they will get notified whenever a new subgraph, up, subgraph upgrade intent message is received. We're also going to add another exciting addition to this feature next week in the next subgraph radio release. Um, um, indexers will be able to configure automatic pre-syncing of the new subgraph deployment once a subgraph upgrade intent message is received. So they will just need to provide their indexer management server URL and all of that can be automated. Um, the subgraph upgrade pre-syncing feature is still very much in uh, alpha. So it's not recommended for production use yet, but we will keep you posted. Um, so how does the subgraph developer do that? Well, we have this thing called a one-shot CLI and the one-shot CLI enables sending one-off messages to the network. So currently its default behavior is to take a set of configuration values and then construct and send a message um, for the subgraph update pre-syncing feature. So uh, a subgraph developer would, would use this, provide the necessary information and send that message off to any indexer who is interested in that subgraph, who, who, who has syncing that subgraph. Uh, so if you hear the screenshot of how a subgraph developer would use it to send a, a, a one-off message. And 
In terms of next steps, uh, we plan on improving the user experience of the OneShot CLI for sure. Uh, in order to make it more accessible to subgraph developers. Uh, we also plan to improve the um, um, upgrade resyncing feature on the subgraph radio to allow uh, indexers to better handle um, receiving those messages as we spoke about with the indexer management server. Uh, but we will soon release more information on all of that. Then the second one is GraphCast Web. So if we take a, a bit of a further look in the future, we, are, we, are, we, really, we plan on releasing GraphCast Web, which is, GraphCast for the browser, which would enable uh, things like having a um, um, interface, a web interface for subgraph developers to, to send those messages instead of the one-shot CLI, um, but uh, which, which can be a part of the subgraph studio even. Um, but GraphCast Web would also unlock better aggregation options and, and presentation options of, of all of the data flowing in the GraphCast network. It could be visualized in the web, which really is going to unlock a lot of exciting stuff. Uh, and then the last one is refining subgraph radio and the POI cross-checking feature. Uh, of course, uh, we plan on improving that with the help of users. We want to get as much feedback as we can. Uh, we, we have a GitHub issue dedicated for, for feedback, feature requests, bugs, and it'll help us immensely if everyone joins in on that conversation. Here are some resources. The last one is that uh, request for feedback issue that I mentioned. And I think I'm running a bit... Um, um above on time yeah. so yeah thanks a, a lot all right thanks but we are uh, over time a little bit thanks for speeding up uh there's an interesting discussion in the chat so we can continue just so we and if sure just 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 to be sure we can still cover adam's uh, updates on graph node but indeed you didn't have on your in your slot in your slide on next steps but we are we just started exploring this idea of the connecting um the sub subgraph radio with uh, subgraph studio so that developers can through studio share this upgrade intent message with indexers so that they can do the pre-sync uh, before they actually migrate over and that will allow us to get no downtime during these upgrades which is pretty cool but uh, yeah and graph cli as adam mentioned anyway plenty of stuff to be done uh, all right thank you petco again please use the chat to ask questions and the forum we have to move we have to continue. Adam, are you online? Yeah. Hey. Lots, Adam. Oh, there you go. Hey. There's nothing. TypeScript is a good thing, everybody. It's a tool for the job. No, holy wars, please. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about graph node. Um, let me share my screen. Um, can you see this guy? Yes, sir. Full screen. So it's quite a sort of in, informal thing, just running through some of the recent changes to GraphNode, also touching on some of the stuff that is coming coming soon. I think folks will have seen um, seen last last month the sort of uh, full availability of um, Ethereum mainnet substreams powered subgraphs in the network. That's obviously the culmination of a bunch of work. Um, from a load of different teams, different core developers um, to make that a reality. And there's obviously a lot of focus on the substreams, um, uh, sort of syncing speed capabilities. But I think one one thing I want to talk about a bit today was um, <clears throat> sort of supporting substreams um, and, and how we thought about this within graph node. I think one thing we were super conscious of um, was that uh, as soon as you've got um, substreams as the ingestion method rather than the existing um, <clears throat> sort of, well, RPC or FIOS based ingestion method, um, actually the write to the database might become more of a bottleneck than it was. Um, and so uh, this is something that we actually saw with some some um, substreams pad subgraphs that we were syncing when we were testing. Um, and so for folks who don't um, don't know that the, the um, processing within graph node is already sort of pipelined. You've essentially got the process running and then you've got the um, write in, interaction with the store and those things can be parallelized. And that was work that um, David Lutter had done um, a while a while back. Um, but I think I think the like like to unblock substreams pad subgraphs where we were seeing the store being a huge bottleneck because essentially we we're having to make an update um, on on every block uh, for every block. Uh, there was a sort of batched writes improvement which went into the last release. Uh, this should be a sort of seamless um, thing for indexes, but obviously super interested if folks are seeing behaviors that uh, that surprise them. But this essentially says okay during syncing, so not the chain head, but when you're syncing history, um, you actually don't need to be updating on every block. You can batch writes, um, so essentially uh, batch up um, 
database interactions, which then does, has a bunch of positive benefits. It um, overall like like reduces the time for store interactions. It uh, reduces database contentions if you're running loads of subgraphs, um, and this actually and like enabled us to radically improve. Um, thinking of substream space subgraphs, but the exciting thing is that this has a sort of had a horizontal benefit on all subgraphs. So a mini subgraph, which has lots of, which has lots of database interactions. So um, that's subgraphs, which um, essentially have lots of interactions on every block. So that'd be your sort of uni swaps or any um, sort of block type subgraphs. We saw um, big improvements. Um, and so that was quite a nice thing, which like under the hood was the thing that enabled the sub substreams um, changes. Uh, we're obviously still working on robustness. So coming soon, some things within the substreams pad subgraphs. Um, um, integration uh we've so so at the moment only um like evm types um substreams endpoints are supported so made some changes to support um other graph node supported protocols so that'll be um near and uh yeah cosmos space change and there's some thinking which um isn't isn't done yet but how we like how we can add support for um protocols which actually don't have a native um, graph um, indexing integration. So then it becomes much more essentially just a, a, a generic sync, which is um, pretty interesting. And there's some thinking there about a streamlined way to do that. So the, the nuance with um, subgraphs is that as well as just connecting to the to the subtrains endpoint and streaming data, you want to have some sense of where the chain head is so you can provide useful information to developers like status and sync status and that kind of stuff. Um, and so that's, that's where a little bit of the nuance is. Um, and then there's also some other changes around passing substreams params from a subgraph manifest. And uh, yeah, we're, I, I guess, um, excited to see a bunch, uh, like a bunch of folks experimenting with um, with substreams. I know Streamfast team are doing more and more tracking of the open source development of substreams that we're seeing. Um, and so, yeah, so that uh, graph node integration is, is, is continuing to be iterated on. And yeah, these should be coming in the next um, release, uh, which I think. Oh, the other thing I want to kind of mention or call out um, but again, interested in indexes, um, indexes feedback here. One thing that has improved a lot since, um, like like over the last couple of years, is graph nodes resilience and robustness to failures. So that's subgraph failures. So having more retries, um, uh, allowing you to configure more providers. Um, but uh, there's always a bit of a game whack a mole because providers will always find quite um, interesting and exotic ways to to fail. And so. Um, uh, we've been doing, I guess, work to firstly give indexes a bit more flexibility. So if folks want to just configure fires and substreams endpoints, not to need to configure an RPC as well, um, which, um, which, uh, yeah, again, gives uh, people flexibility in how they want to run their stack. Um, and then the other, the, the other side is, is more and more failover between providers. Um, so that's, I think, another new feature. So then getting into the world of subgraph features, derived field loading. So this is accessing derived fields within mappings. Um, for subgraph developers, this means you don't have to store massive arrays on your um, on your entities. That keeps uh, your database happy because big, big um, arrays on entities are not very efficient. Um, and also, um, yeah, should uh, generally make things uh, like a, like a bit, a, a bit quicker when you're querying and also indexing. Um, we think this is quite a, um, an uplift for developers. Um, Version 32 I mentioned is hopefully coming out soon, so watch out for that. Um, and then we've got some other stuff um, coming soon around periodic block handlers and are we file data sources? Um, so periodic block handlers are essentially more like cron, like more like cron type jobs, whereas currently you can only run on every block. Um, and also initialization, so running a bunch of like creating a bunch of state on your first handler, which is quite nice. Um, which is quite nice if you want to hydrate a bunch of state. Um, and then the last thing uh, is are we file data sources? So watch out for this. We're pretty excited about this as the first addition to file data sources after IPFS. And yeah, I think that was, that's all I got. Oh, right on time, Adam. Thank you. So much content there. Uh, there's an interesting discussion, Adam. Do you want to address Derek's question? I think it's relevant, like last minute. Is there anything inside the subgraph mappings that is needed to enable the batch insert, or is it that handled completely by graph node? No, so that so that should be um, handled sort of completely by by graph node. That's a, should just just roll out and hopefully hopefully work seamlessly. So let me know if it doesn't. <laughs> um, but, but essentially, you might just see different logs during indexing. He'll talk about writing about writing batches and how big the batches were. So so it's on by default. Um, okay yeah we're over time again thank you all i'm trying to look in the chat if you have anything to address but i don't think so it's good this question going 
but not a question for you, Adam. Um, all right, folks, again, uh, follow up in the forum, Discord, GitHub, wherever you want. This will be uploaded to YouTube as always. Um, Darby here is doing a great summary in a Twitter thread or X thread or whatever we, we want to call it now. That's also helpful. And we'll put the meeting notes in the forum.